to this uh, last installment of the uh, seminar series that the Institute for Sustainable Solutions here at PSU has put on for this spring term. My name is Robbie Richardson. I'm the Associate Director for the Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here uh, for a very interesting evening. Um, before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to just ask a couple of housekeeping uh, issues. Uh, if everyone could please turn off your cell phones so we can uh, focus our attention on the speaker. And also, uh, we are streaming live as a webinar this evening and recording uh, by video the seminar for YouTube posterity. So when we get to this uh, s part of the evening when we have questions and discussion, we'd like to ask that you please step up to this floor microphone in the center rather than asking your uh, question or delivering your comment from your seat so that we, you can be heard um, on the webinar and in the recording. Uh, I would also like to gratefully acknowledge the support of the Portland Center for Public Humanities uh, as a co-sponsor of tonight's uh, seminar, and also Ilahi, uh, who, who has co-sponsored the events around this, um, around the visit from this speaker. We are very fortunate this evening to have Tim Kasser with us. Uh, Dr. Kasser is a professor of psychology and chair chairman of the Department of Psychology at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. Uh, he holds uh, degrees from Vanderbilt University and the University of Rochester. And he's the author of the very interesting High Price of Materialism, uh, a very good book. And tonight he's gonna speak with us about human identity and environmental challenges. Uh, Tim has been very generous with his time during his visit uh, this week. Um, in addition to tonight's seminar, uh, following the seminar this evening, uh, he will host uh, a salon discussion at the Davis Street Tavern, so just down the Max line a little bit, at 500 Northwest Davis. This will begin around 7 o'clock p.m., and so if you'd like to continue the discussion and conversation that uh, Dr. Kasser brings uh, to us tonight, you are invited to join uh, a, a group conversation down the street at Davis Street Tavern. And also tomorrow at noon, uh, Tim Kasser will uh, convene a workshop uh, for a couple of hours to continue some of the ideas and themes that he brings out in tonight's discussion. So if you are interested and available to attend this uh, workshop tomorrow, it will be held at noon in the sustainability suite of the Market Center building, which is 1600 Southwest 4th Avenue in a conference room, room 127. So you are invited to uh, both of those events in addition to tonight. So with that said, I hope that you will join me in welcoming Tim Kasser. Hi, well thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity to have the chance to speak with you tonight and uh, maybe later on today as well as tomorrow too. So I want to go ahead and dive right in. So if we can put these front lights off or down a little bit, we'll get started so you can see the overheads a little bit. Is that going to be, nobody's going to fall asleep on me though, right? <laughs> so as, as you well know, uh, we in the modern day face quite a number of different environmental challenges uh, that are rather scary for us. We've got a variety of different problems due to carbon emissions and pollution. Uh, we have pollution that's of various sorts that is killing animals and species worldwide. We have the loss of various kinds of habitat which uh, threatens, again, multiple different kinds of species, eventually including our own. We have to remember that we are a species as well that inhabits this planet. And a lot of people have invested a lot of time and a lot of energy in trying to meet these kinds of different environmental challenges that we face. And I want to just kind of run through some of the approaches that have been used thus far. Um, you know, one of the major things that many uh, people have done is to do more and more scientific research in order to document the various kinds of problems that the environment faces. And so we have an enormous body of literature about um, species decimation, about carbon emissions, about various kinds of pollution. And the strategy here of environmentalists, I think, has been that 
if we get all this research out into people's minds and, and let them know about the various problems that are scientifically documented, then people will respond in ways which lead us to behave differently. Unfortunately, that's clearly not the case. You know, a lot of the research that has been put out there, although quite well done and sometimes making its way into the media, has been uh, met with either public denial, oh, that's not really happening or we're not the cause of it, or sometimes apathy, uh, well, who really cares about that species or there's nothing I can do about it anyway, so why bother? So that strategy has had some successes, but not as successful as we might hope. So another strategy that some environmentalists have taken is to say, okay, well, what we need to do is we need to get people to engage in relatively simple behavior changes, relatively simple and painless things. So they need to do things like, you know, turn down the thermostat a degree or buy a compact fluorescent light bulb or something like that. And then if we can get people to make these simple behavioral changes, if lots of people do that, then we'll end up uh, helping the environment. And if maybe they make one simple behavior change, then they'll make 10 more later on. But unfortunately, again, the research doesn't suggest that this has really worked all that well. There's not very much good evidence empirically that engaging in one simple behavior leads to what is called a spillover effect, okay, where people do one thing and then they quickly do 10 more things, okay? Sometimes there's actually what's called a rebound effect, where people do one thing, like say put more insulation in their house, they save more money on heating bills and then they use that to fly to Cancun on vacation, okay? So these kinds of rebounds effects end up uh, not helping the environment very much. So the environmentalists say, well, you know, if that hasn't worked, then what we need to do is to change policy and do a top-down kind of thing. So if we can get policy changes um, at the level of the government or level of businesses, then maybe we'll be able to make more uh, progress on environmental kinds of challenges. But once again, we see that this has been quite limited because what ends up happening is that most of the, the meaningful policy changes which could happen get sort of watered down and tinkered around with because the politicians say, look, I don't have the people clamoring to want these kinds of uh, changes to happen at the policy level. Why would I vote for this? This isn't something my constituents tend to be in favor of. And so we end up with relatively small sorts of changes or no changes at all like we saw at Copenhagen at all. Now, as um, I've been thinking about these things and doing some work with Tom Crompton at the WWF in the United Kingdom, what we've started to do is to say, okay, each of those strategies has had their successes, but they haven't been successful enough in terms of meeting the environmental challenges that we face. And so we've been trying to develop a strategy that will inform those other strategies as well as will potentially develop some other strategies that environmentalists can use in order to try to meet the sort of environmental challenges that we face. And we've been focusing a lot on human identity. As you heard, I'm a psychologist, so I think about things like identity a fair bit. And we feel that identity is something which can be quite relevant to um, trying to meet the environmental challenges we face. One of the reasons is because we know from the research that when people are confronted with different kinds of information, whether or not they take that information in depends in part upon their pre-existing identity. So one of the reasons maybe people haven't paid so much attention to all this scientific research is it bounces right off of their identity. If they have an identity which is already set up to say, I don't really care so much about the environment or I care about other things. So if we can make some changes to identity, um, we might be able to make it so people are more responsive to this kinds of information. We also know from the scientific research that human identity is very relevant for getting people to engage in behavior. And obviously we need people to change their behaviors substantially more than just buying a compact fluorescent light bulb. And so again, if we think about these dynamics at an identity level, that might have bigger effects in terms of behavior. And then, of course, as we all know from discussions about identity politics and things like that, people's identities have a very big influence on the kinds of political actions that they're willing to engage in and willing to support. And so, again, if we think about human identity, that might end up having some sort of ramifications later on for the kinds of uh, political actions and support that uh, are necessary in order to get those policy changes that we're after. So this is why we've thought, in addition to other reasons that I hope will become clearer later on, why we've thought that focusing on human identity might be a worthwhile tack. 
Now, there are three main kinds of human identity that we've looked at um, in the work that we've done. I'm not going to talk about all of them tonight, but I just want to give you a basic overview. Uh, one of them has to do with group identity. So one of the fundamental ways in which we define ourselves uh, in terms of identity has to do with the groups we belong to. So, you know, am I white? Am I black? Am I male? Am I female? Am I an Oregonian or an Illinoisan? Um, you know, am I American or someone else? Am I a Christian or not? Okay, so our group identities end up influencing how we think of ourselves. And one of the fundamental identities we have is that of human. And if we think of ourselves as humans, sometimes we think of other species as non-humans, and then maybe we just don't care about them so much. And there's a lot of research that suggests that these, what are called in-group, out-group dynamics can end up influencing how we treat other species. Another kind of identity uh, feature that Tom and I have written about has to do with coping strategies. You know, all of us like to be able to not feel super stressed or anxious. And when we do feel stressed or anxious, we sometimes use coping strategies as a way to diminish that feeling of stress. Now, some coping strategies might end up being fairly good for the environment. You know, so if I cope by going out and trying to get politically involved or change my behavior, that's a pretty good coping strategy. On the other hand, when we're presented with really scary information about all the doom and gloom that might come from environmental problems, Maybe sometimes we respond by becoming apathetic, like Rene Lertzman has written about, or maybe we respond by saying, heck, if the world's gonna end, I might as well party it up now, okay? Which is, again, another way that people sometimes try to cope, which isn't so good for the environment. The third aspect of identity, that, and the aspect that I'm gonna be focusing on tonight, has to do with our values and goals, the things that are important to us in life and that we strive for in life. Now, as a psychologist, um, when I think about values and goals, how I define them is as guiding principles in life. They're ideas that we have in our heads as to what's important in life so that we can make some decisions when we're walking our way through life about what to do next, okay? So if I care a lot about certain things, when I'm presented with a choice, I'm probably gonna make choices that move me in that direction. But if I care about something else, I may go in a different direction. So our values guide us in these ways. And we know from the psychological research that values and goals end up influencing people's attitudes, okay? So if I'm somebody who cares a lot about money, let's say, um, then I'm probably gonna have positive attitudes towards certain objects in the environment, like say a magazine like uh, Cosmo or a magazine like Fortune 500, okay, or Fortune. Those are, I'm gonna have a positive attitude towards. But if I care about other things, maybe I wouldn't like those magazine so much. Uh, similarly, the kinds of values I have influence the attitudes that I have towards political possibilities and potential laws. Again, if I have the value that what's most important is to make a lot of money, I'm probably going to be more in favor of, pos of uh, policy positions which maximize economic growth or which keep more of my hard-earned money in my own pocket instead of sending it to Washington. Okay, so our values end up influencing our attitudes, including our attitudes about ecological behavior, as we'll see. And then as I've already uh, mentioned, our values end up influencing our behavior. So Friday at four o'clock, when I have to make a choice whether to stay in my office and work some more and try to pump out yet another paper or try to get some grant money or go home and play with my kids, all other things being equal, my values are gonna end up influencing which of those two things I do. I can't do them both Friday at four, okay? So when my values come into play, the things about how much I care about achievement might lead me to engage in one kind of behavior and my family in a different one. Now it might seem like there are dozens and thousands of different kinds of values which one would care about potentially, but the research shows that you can actually sort the number of values that uh, most people orient their lives around to about a dozen or so values. And um, one of the things we know about values from the value research is that they're organized in systems, okay? And I'll be explaining this in a lot more detail in just a minute here, but values, it doesn't make sense to talk about one value in and of itself, because any value that you have sits within a value system in which you have lots of potential different things that you might care about, and those things might sometimes be competing with each other, or sometimes they might facilitate each other. 
And we know that these uh, value systems are organized in the particular way that they are because there's been research done in literally dozens of different nations around the world, rich nations, poor nations, um, with thousands of people, if not tens of thousands of people. And the, the research suggests that these systems seem to be fairly consistent across humans and across different cultures. There really isn't a whole lot of variation in terms of how the system itself is oriented in people's minds. And what you find in these systems is, as I've already alluded to, that some values tend to be compatible with each other. That is, it's psychologically easy to, com to pursue value A and pursue value B because they, an they aim towards the same ends. However, um, other, research, other values tend to stand in conflict with each other. So pursuing value A sometimes tends to be in conflict with pursuing value X, as I'm going to show you in a minute. Now, the way that you can represent these, um, these value systems in people's minds are what are, with what are called circumplex models. Okay, and a circumplex, as you're guessing, is a circle. Okay, and what is going to you're going to see here in a moment is uh, circumplex models in which the values have been plotted along the uh, dimension of a circle, and psychologically compatible values sit next to each other in this circle, and values which are in conflict with each other sit on opposite sides of the circle. Now, before I, I show you the circle, I want to say two things about it. The first is that there's a fair bit of information in these circumplex models, and I don't want you to try to pay attention to them all. I'll, I'll direct you to what's going to be most relevant to this talk. The second thing I want to emphasize is that these are not theoretical models of people's value systems. These are models which are based on tens of thousands of people filling out surveys that are well validated in dozens of nations around the world. This is what comes from asking people about what is important to them. Okay, It's not just something some psychologist sat in their office and made up. Now, here's the uh, first and most uh, well-known value circumplex, and it comes from the seminal work of Shalom Schwartz, who's a researcher in Israel. Um, and what I want to focus you on here first are what are called the self-enhancement values for achievement and power. Now, what you can see here is that achievement is right next to power. Achievement are values which concern trying to be really successful by the rules of your particular society. And power involves things like having a lot of status, having a lot of prestige, having a lot of money. And you can see that these are right next to each other because, as probably makes sense to you intuitively, it's fairly easy to simultaneously pursue values for achievement at the same time that you're pursuing values for power and status and prestige, right? Does that make sense to people? Okay, those two aims generally go together. Um, here are the, some of the specific values which make up these two or specific items which make up some of these self-enhancing values. And again, I think you can see that these, uh, why the reason Schwartz called these the self-enhancing values is because they tend to be values which are about trying to seem better, okay, trying to make myself seem like I am better than I am right at the moment. Now, these self-enhancing values stand in opposition to what Schwartz calls the self-transcendence values up here. Okay. Now, these are the values of benevolence and universalism, which are consistent with each other. Benevolence values tend to concern things like um, caring about my family and my friends and the people that are close to me. Universalism values concern things like trying to make the whole world a better place, trying to benefit people in other countries or other species or generations yet unborn. And what you can see from this uh, circumplex is that to the extent that people focus on these self-enhancement values, they tend to focus less on self-transcendence values and vice versa. They stand in relative conflict with each other. And I'll show you more data about that later on in the talk. Here are some of the specific uh, value items which are used by Schwartz in order to assess self-transcendence. So I think that can give you a sense of what these are about. Now, here's a second circumplex which has some of the same sort of findings. It hasn't been used in as many um, nations. It's only 15 nations instead of 70. Okay, but nonetheless, you'll see in a moment that it uh, replicates a lot of the same stuff that we've just talked about with regard to Schwartz. Over here, we have what we call the extrinsic values for popularity, image, and financial success, which are more or less like the self-enhancing values. These are values where you're focused on trying to make a lot of money, trying to have status and prestige. Okay, And they're next to each other because they're psychologically compatible with each other. Caring about your 
image, you know, usually when you care about your image, you're trying to be popular. And the main way in which we tend to express our image is through possessions like our clothes, our house, et cetera. Um, here again are some of the specific items which are used in order to assess these extrinsic values. On the flip side, what we see are the intrinsic values, okay? These are values for community, which is more or less like Schwartz's universalism, affiliation, which is more or less like Schwartz's benevolence, <coughs> excuse me, and self-acceptance, which is the desire to grow and to be the person that you really could be. And again, here are some of the specific items which are relevant. Now, there's two main ways that you can think about values, and if, I promise that soon I'm going to be getting you to the environment here, okay, because they're very relevant to how we think about the environment. Um, and the first way that we tend to think about values is probably the way that most of you have in your mind right now, which has to do with your dispositions, the way that people generally are. So what I'd like everybody to do for a moment is to bring to mind somebody they know who really cares about trying to make the world a better place. And now somebody who cares a lot about their family. And now somebody you know who really seems to care a lot about their status and achievement. Was everybody able to do that? Okay, now that's a good example of the dispositional way of thinking about it. Probably what you were doing was you were thinking about somebody who over time and in a lot of different situations tends to express these kinds of values over and over again, okay? And that's one important way to talk about values. But there's a second way that's also very important to talk about values and it has to do with the activation of values. This is, uh, has to do with our moment-to-moment -moment changes as we go through life in terms of which values we are oriented to at a particular moment. So now what I'd like you to do is to, bring, is to think about the last two weeks of your own life. And I'd like you to think about a time when you were really focused on helping the world be a better place. And now I'd like you to think about a time when you were really focused on the people you love. And now I'd like you to think about a time when you were really focused on your own achievement and status. And just to make you a little happier, now you can think about hedonism for a second. Okay. Now my point in doing this is to demonstrate to you that we all have all of these values. Okay? And as we walk our way through life, what ends up happening is different situations, both in the external environment that we're in, as well as internally, lead us to move around the circumplex and focus on different particular aims in life at different times. Now and then, you know, so I might spend some time down here in the achievement realm of things, but then something else happens which makes me care about helping the world, and then I'm really concerned about uh, having pleasure, et cetera. I move around. Now the reason that this is important is because both the dispositional and the activation of values end up having very important ramifications for environmental attitudes and behaviors, as I'd like to show you next. So one of the things we know from the substantial amount of research is that the more people are focused dispositionally on those self-enhancing and extrinsic values, the worse their ecological behaviors and the worse their ecological attitudes are in terms of sustainability. On the flip side, to the, fo to the extent that people are dispositionally focused on those intrinsic values and those self-transcendent values, they tend to have more positive and more sustainable ecological attitudes and behaviors, as I'll show you next. So one of the things we know is that if you ask people how much they care about the environment, or um, how much they think it's important that we protect the environment. What the research consistently shows in multiple nations is that the more people say that they care about things like money and status and image, the less they tend to care about the environment. On the flip side, the more that people tend to say that they care about things like helping the world be a better place and loving their family, the more positive attitudes do they have towards the environment. If you ask people about environmental damage and you say, why are you concerned about environmental damage? What you find is that people who are more focused on those extrinsic values say, well, I'm worried about it might affect me. They don't tend to care so much about how it might affect other people, animals, or future generations. Okay, they have a self-centered sense of why environmental damage might be problematic. People focused on those intrinsic values, though, not that they're unconcerned with how it might affect them, but they're especially concerned with how it might affect other people, animals, and future generations. 
We also know that these values end up influencing people's ecological behavior. So for example, if you put people into uh, resource dilemma games in the laboratory and you say, okay, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pretend to be a timber company and you're gonna, you've got this um, amount of forest that you can harvest and we want you to go ahead and um, play a game where you're harvesting some of the forest and you let them do that over multiple years of harvesting, what you find is that the more people are dispositionally focused on these extrinsic values, the greedier they become and the less sustainably they behave in terms of harvesting the forest. On the flip side, intrinsically oriented people sustain the forest longer. We also know that these values are associated with um, how much you engage in those simple behaviors like riding a bicycle or making bread or reusing um, both sides of the paper. Um, in the way that you probably would predict. We also know that these values are associated with the size of people's ecological footprints. People who are more intrinsically and self-transcendently oriented have lower ecological footprints. They make lifestyle choices which lead them to ride bikes more and to have smaller houses and to eat less meat um, and therefore to use uh, fewer resources in the world. Similar results have been found at the national level. Okay, so I have a paper that just come out, came out where what I did was I looked at about 20 different wealthy nations, okay, mostly Western European, North America, Australia, et cetera. And I was able to um, get information about how much the citizens in those nations valued those self-enhancing kinds of concerns for achievement and status and power versus how much they valued those self-transcendent concerns for social justice and a world of beauty. And I correlated that with the carbon emissions of each of those nations. And what you end up finding is that the more that the citizens of a nation care about self-enhancement values, the higher their carbon emissions, even after you control for the wealth of the nation. So we have kind of dispositions at the national level as well. So what I've just shown you, I hope, is that personal dispositions towards one set of values or another end up having ramifications for people's ecological behavior. Now I want to show you that the same thing happens, to do, happens when you ask about activating people's values. And what you're going to see here from this research is that momentarily activating people's values ends up, on the first hand, if you activate one value, then people end up also activating other similar values on the same side of the circumplex, and they end up behaving in ways consistent with that. And that seems pretty obvious, right? But here's the more interesting finding. You actually end up suppressing the values on the other side of the circumplex as well, as I'll show you now. So um, what this means, just to remind you then, is that to the extent that I activate image, I'm gonna also be activating popularity and financial success but I'm actually gonna be suppressing community and affiliation even though I don't even talk about those in the activation. Here's a study which shows this, which was done by Greg Mayo at Cardiff University. What he did was he brought students into the lab and he measured their values. He measured how much they cared about self-enhancement, self-transcendent, and some other values. Then what he did was he assigned them to one of three different groups. One of the groups, the control group, just measured words like, or memorized words like desk or onomatopoeia or whatever, okay? A second group was told that their peers at Cardiff University really valued four of the self-transcendent aims, like benevolence and helping other people and stuff. And then the third group was told that their peers really valued four self-enhancing aims, like achievement and money, okay? Then, all those students were given another measure of their values that had new self-enhancement and new self-transcendent values on it. And here's what Greg found. So here's the change in people's self-transcendent values. So again, this is not very surprising. If you were told that your peers cared a lot about self-transcendence, then you increased in self-transcendence. But look what happened over here. Okay, if you were told that your, your peers cared a lot about self-enhancement, your self-transcendence values went down. These people weren't told a thing about how much their peers cared about self-enhancement. Okay? But they nonetheless, just by thinking about those self-enhancement values, self-transcendence went down. The same thing happens in reverse if you look at the change in self-enhancing values. If you're told your peers care a lot about self-enhancement, you do more too. 
But look what happens if you're told your peers care about self-transcendence. Self-enhancement goes down. Just by momentarily activating people's values, because of the way that values are set up in people's minds, you get the positive effect on the values you just talked about, but you get a suppression effect. It's like a seesaw. As one goes up, the other one's going to come down. Here's another example of it. This is a paper that's just about ready to come out uh, any day now. Um, and I did it with Ken Sheldon at the University of Missouri. And what we did was we brought people into the lab, college students into the lab, and we had them think about one of five different identities. We either asked them to think about being human, to think about being a University of Missouri student, to think about being an American, and then the other two groups, we asked them to think about being an extrinsic American, which meant we reminded them that America is a place where you can come and you can make a lot of money and you can go to Hollywood and become a star. Or we reminded some of the people that about being an intrinsic American, that America is a place where you can have the opportunity for a lot of self-expression, where, uh, where people care a lot about their families, and America has a long history of being a generous nation. I want you to know, we did not mention the environment at all. Then what we did was we said, imagine that you have been asked by the President of the United States to set environmental policy in order to tell the average American what his or her ecological footprint should be five years from now, and to recommend how people should live with regard to things like riding bicycles and how much meat they eat and things like that. We gave them 11 items to measure that. And here's what we found, was that if you ask people to think about intrinsic, being an intrinsic American, whoops, people recommended significantly lower ecological footprints than any other group. Here's a particularly scary finding, is that there's actually no difference between thinking about being an American and thinking about being an extrinsic American. By activating the idea of American in these college students, we were also apparently activating extrinsic values. But the main point I want you to walk away with is that by activating these intrinsic values, by not even mentioning the environment, but by framing being an American in a particular way, which focused on those intrinsic values, we were able to lead people to change their attitudes and their policy recommendations about environmental issues. Now what about behavior? Well, Martin von Steenkeest in Belgium did a very elegant and beautiful study with some Belgian education students. He brought them into the lab. These are people who want to become teachers one day. And he said, you know, um, I'm going to teach you about recycling. And he gave them a text to read about recycling. He told half of the people that the reason that it's important to learn about recycling is it'll help your community, which is an intrinsic frame. And he told the other half of the students that the reason that it's important to recycle is it'll save your school district money. So he, that was it. It was like a 10 second manipulation, okay? Do we talk about recycling in an intrinsic way or an extrinsic way? Then what he did was he followed those education students for the next week. And they came back a week later and they took a test. And the people who had had the material framed in an intrinsic way learned the material about recycling better. He also had put some articles on reserve at the library, and he actually was able to measure whether or not the student had gone to the library and gotten the reserve article. People who had had it framed, recycling framed in an intrinsic way, were more likely to go to the library and learn more. And then he also offered to take everybody on a free field trip to a recycling plant to learn even more. People who had had the recycling framed in an intrinsic fashion were significantly more likely to want to sign up, or to actually sign up to go on the field trip. From a 10 second differential framing of what it means to recycle. Now, what are the implications of this? Well, there are multiple implications, and I don't have time to talk about them all tonight, but I want to focus on three. There's a term that's used in my medicine called iatrogenic effects. An iatrogenic effect is when a doctor treats you to try to cure a disease and actually ends up making that disease worse or makes some other disease worse, okay? It's an accidental effect where the treatment actually causes more suffering. 
Tom Crompton and I have been suggesting that certain environmental messages might actually be iatrogenic, okay? That to the extent that as environmentalists, we frame environmental behaviors as being focused around extrinsic values and around self-enhancing values, we're doing two potentially problematic things. The, the, the issue is, is that what we're ending up doing is we're reinforcing those self-enhancing values, okay? When we make motivational appeals to people based on self-interested, self-enhancing values and focus on things like the business case for sustainability or green consumption or fees for environmental services and things like that, what we have just told the person is the reason to engage in environmental behavior is because it's good for self-enhancing values. Okay, it's gonna benefit self-enhancing values. Now by doing that, what we have done is we have led the person to A, think that self-enhancing values are perhaps more important than they did just a little bit ago, and B, we have activated the self-enhancing values in the person's motivational system. And that means we've suppressed the self-transcendent values. And what do we know? Well, we know that self-enhancing values tend to lead people to not care so much about the environment, whereas self-transcending ones do. So Tom and I have been raising the question about whether or not a major strategy that environmentalists have been pursuing for the last 20 years might actually account for why we've had less success than we might have. Another thing we need to focus on is fear-based messages. Okay, we hear, I mean, let's face it, thinking about environmental damage is scary, okay? And we do a lot of stuff in order to cope with it. Now one of the things we know from the research is that to the extent people become feeling psychologically insecure, they actually orient towards self-enhancing values and away from self-transcendent values. The research shows that when people feel psychologically insecure because of economic insecurity, because of relational security, and because of their own death, people end up saying self-enhancing values are more important to them. They orient more in a materialistic way, and they orient away from those intrinsic goals. So to the extent we use fear-based messaging, or to the extent we make people afraid just by talking about all of the problems, we may actually be working towards moving people towards the very values which we know are problematic. A second implication of this research that I'd like to leave you with tonight is that we might want to be thinking about forming coalitions with other groups. Let's face it, there, we're stuck in a very deep and entrenched system which is very focused on the self-enhancing value of making as much profit and economic growth as possible. And turning that system around is gonna be very difficult. And no one environmental group by itself is gonna do that. And all the environmental groups together probably aren't gonna do that. The only solution, in my viewpoint, is to band together with like-minded groups who also should be caring about those same values. And there's good reason to think that those groups are out there because one of the things we know is that the more people are focused on intrinsic values, the happier they are. And the more people are focused on materialistic values, the less happy they are. We know, for example, that the more people are focused on these extrinsic values, the less self-actualized and vital they feel, the less satisfied they are with their life, the fewer pleasant emotions they experience. We also know that um, intrinsic values protect against depression and anxiety, physical symptoms, and drug and alcohol use. So to the extent that there are people out there who maybe don't seem to care much about the environment, but care a lot about motivating people to be healthier and well, the same values are relevant, and we can join together around those values. Similarly, I've been doing a lot of work with Oxfam in the, the UK. Now, Oxfam cares about the environment, um, but mostly what they care about is helping poor people. It turns out that these very same values are also quite relevant to social justice kinds of issues. So we know, for example, that the more people are focused on extrinsic self-enhancing values, the less empathic they are. Well, you know, empathy is a prerequisite for wanting to help somebody else, okay? And if your values are leading you to be less empathic, it's unlikely you're going to be trying to help uh, people who are in trouble at other parts of the world. We also know that these values uh, bear relationship to what's called social dominance orientation. SDO is a psychological term that basically measures 
the attitude that my group is better than yours and your group deserves all the bad things that have happened to it because your group is dumb or lazy or stupid or whatever. That's what SDO is. We know from the research that the more people are focused on self-enhancing values, the more likely they are to um, agree with those kinds of statements. That's not going to help move us in a pro-social, socially just way. And several studies by now have also shown that people who endorse self-enhancing values also are more likely to endorse racial and ethnically prejudicial attitudes, which again stand in the way of pro-social values. So one of the things then I'd like to suggest is that if we form coalitions with other groups who maybe are interested in something other than the environment, but they can see that the same values are relevant for them as are relevant for environmental outcomes, then maybe together we can have more success. The final thing I'd like to uh, leave you with has to do with another strategy, um, which has to do with coming up with new kinds of campaigns which may not on the surface of them seem like they're an environmental campaign but actually are because one of the things we have to recognize is there are a variety of different things out there in the world which cause people to focus on self-enhancing and extrinsic values and I don't have time to talk about them all tonight um, but if we can work against whatever causes those kinds of values in our campaigns, then we can diminish how much people care about those, or those kinds of values, and thus we might be able to have some good ecological benefits. So what I'm just going to talk about is advertising. One of the things we know about advertising is that, A, the more people ingest commercial media, the more likely they dispositionally focus on materialistic extrinsic values. We also know that advertising momentarily activates in your mind those concerns for image and popularity and status. Okay, they're designed to promote consumerism. Obviously, overconsumption is a major problem for our ecological um, welfare. Um, it creates feelings of insecurity. Advertising also oftentimes says, oh, you know, um, you're this person and they're that. This beautiful, wonderful person who uses our deodorant um, is so happy. Why aren't you like him? Okay, well, there's the insecurity, which leads you in a more materialistic way. Okay, and I also think that there's a real problem in the sense that almost everywhere you go, you encounter these kinds of messages, which lead us to think that this is what's important and that then to support that dispositional value. So a lot of campaigns that we could do that don't seem, again, like they're directly about helping the environment, but actually are, are things like um, removing ads from public places. Okay? What that does is diminish the likelihood that people get this message all the time that consumption is good and extrinsic values are good. Banning advertising to children. One of the things marketers know is that they need to work hard in order to get little kids in to care about these extrinsic and self-enhancing values because those little kids are going to be the next generation that spends a lot. There are nations which have tried to ban or which have banned advertising to children. Um, and if I had more time, I would tell you the sad story of how in 1970s that was attempted here in the United States and failed miserably. Another thing um, that I would like to suggest is that you may not be aware, but in the United States, all of the tens of billions of dollars which are spent on advertising are actually a tax write-off. Okay, People don't pay any taxes on all of that because it's considered a legitimate business expense. I'd like you to imagine for a moment that we consider advertising as a form of value pollution and that we tax it at 10 or 15 or 20 percent. And then we use all of that revenue in order to support more ecological kinds of uh, outcomes as well as using them to develop programs to help promote intrinsic values in children and adults and others. I'll let you know that there was just an article in Advertising Age about two months ago suggesting that the advertising uh, companies are very nervous that this might be something which could be on the horizon here. If people got more behind it, it would be more likely that it could be on the horizon, too. In summary, what I hope that I've done tonight is to give you a sense that as we think about how to make progress on human or on environmental challenges, that we need to be focusing more on human identity. I'm not trying to say we should throw out any of those other strategies which I was critiquing earlier in the talk. They're important strategies. 
But, but if we pay attention to human identity and the, all the features of human identity, we might make more progress when we use those strategies. And we might come up with other kinds of um, strategies that will also be useful for us that will help us to avoid big mistakes, that will uh, help us to form coalitions with other groups that will help us to make more um, progress and that will help us to discourage the damaging identities and promote these helpful ones. Uh, I'd like to just close by mentioning I've got five free copies of a book up front if you, anybody would like them, or you can download it for free at this website. Um, if people are interested in hearing more, uh, there's a, the events later on, as well as feel free to drop me an email. I view my PowerPoint as public access, so if you're interested in any of it, send me an email and I'll be happy to send it your way. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tim. Fascinating, very interesting. Uh, I'm sure it's piqued your interest, so uh, you're invited to come to the um, floor microphone and uh, engage with uh, questions and discussion. Wonderful presentation. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about some of my very dear friends who happen to be graphic designers because that's, you know, they, they work in ad advertising because that's what people who are artists do for a living mm. um, oftentimes. And so I appreciated the information about advertising, but I also feel like until we have a different economic system, this is what we have and maybe there's some way to tweak the advertisements, I don't know, so that it's less polluting and less damaging. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say two things about that. Uh, the first is that, uh, you know, one thing that some advertising people say that they could do would be to, uh, you know, sell things on the basis of intrinsic values, and then they're promoting those intrinsic values. The problem is, is oftentimes that's based on, you know, well, she'll love me if I buy her a diamond or something like that. You could say, well, that's based on intrinsic values because we're promoting love. Uh, my response is always, if the only reason she loves you is because you gave her a diamond, you're in trouble, okay? So I think that uh, there's only so far probably we can go with regard to promoting advertising and, and tweaking advertising in more positive ways. There might be some positive ways we can go, but I think that uh, compared to the uh, vast majority of messages that we get right now that really are encouraging consumption at every um, turn, I think that's problematic. The second thing I would say is that, um, yes, it is the economic system that we do have at the moment, but there are other economic systems available, okay? Uh, to think that our form of corporate consumer capitalism is the only form of capitalism is just wrong. There are other varieties of capitalism, just like there are varieties of Christianity. Um, and to think that there are um, other systems besides capitalism, there are other systems behind, besides capitalism. And I think we have to recognize, you know, and I sort of ducked this in the talk today, but I'll just say it right now, capitalism, corporate capitalism as it's practiced in the United States is part of the problem because it ends up encouraging these kinds of values as a way to maintain itself. And so I think we have to have a real serious discussion about that as well. Thank you for your question. So have you done experiments to see how effective these changes uh, can be in terms of you know, people shifting their, their behaviors and, and, and keeping it that way rather mm -hmm. than maybe just sort of a, a temporary, wow, I'll try that, and then eventually falling back to our kind of habits and whatnot? Right. Thanks. Um, we have done some experiments. Most of what we've done has been short term as uh, the kinds of studies that I've done. And what you have to recognize is that any kind of intervention we do is swimming against the tide of multiple, multiple activations coming from the other end in the meantime, right? You know, so gosh, if I could be, I mean, the last estimate I saw was that there are 3,000 commercial impressions that the average American receives in a day. If somebody wanted to give me funding where I could give 3,000 impressions of intrinsic values a day, I'd be very interested in doing that study, okay, a day after day after day. Nobody's going to give me that funding probably, but that's the problem. But that aside, we just uh, have submitted a paper 
where what we did was we brought uh, adolescents, age 10 to 18, um, in with their parents for three three-hour sessions that were designed over the course of three, you know, so it was you know, a month apart, and uh, we measured their value orientation beforehand, um, six months later, and then, uh, I'm sorry, three months later, and then uh, nine months later, and we found that the intervention was able to change people's, these adolescents' materialistic values. Kids who got, uh, did not get the intervention went up in materialistic values over the year. Kids who got the intervention went down in materialistic values over the year. Uh, we didn't look at environmental behavior in that particular um, study, but we did find that those changes were also associated with changes in self-esteem. Kids who got the intervention were increased in self-esteem um, as their materialism tended to go down. So whether or not that also affects environmental behavior, we don't know yet, um, but the, everything I know of is promising. Thank you uh, very much for your talk. I'm wondering, when you gathered data, did you gather it um, specifically by different cultures, mm -hmm. and particularly the indigenous, those cultures that we normally see are happier? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering whether, when you get, if you gather data from them, if they were different in terms of transcendent or you know, intrinsic versus extrinsic, mm -hmm. and if you then question it all, how they raise their children, mm -hmm. what the pedagogy is that leads them to be mm -hmm. uh, that sort of culture, mm -hmm. and whether they have uh, also, and I don't want to like guide the answer, but whether they have a kind of a more systemic understanding of life. Mm -hmm. Well, we, um, none of the studies that I've done have been done in indigenous cultures, no. Um, with regard to Schwartz's uh, value circumplex, there may be one or two indigenous samples in there, but I'm doubting that it's really focused on. But we certainly have looked at people um, across the world from a variety of different sort of cultural backgrounds, rich and poor, um, north and south hemispheres, et cetera. Um, I do know that there is substantial research looking at um, how different cultures end up leading people to focus on different values in the circumplex, okay? so. Um, what the research shows is that across cultures, the dynamics are more or less constant. Whether you're in a rich nation or a poor nation or whatever, the, these conflicts and compatibilities keep showing up. But how much people care about different values very much does vary, okay? One of the things we know, for example, in two different studies is that the more that you live in a neoliberal capitalist uh, culture that is very focused on making profit and very focused on the free market deregulation, the more the citizens of that nation focus on the self-enhancing extrinsic values, the less they focus on the self-transcendent intrinsic values. I think that starts to point towards what you would find in an indigenous sample, although I can't promise that. With regard to parenting, um, again, nothing at that broad cultural level or with indigenous samples that I'm aware of, but there certainly have been numerous studies that have been done looking at how parenting is relevant to how kids end up focusing on one set of values or another. And I can say a couple of things. The first is that we know, perhaps not surprisingly, that the more parents are focused on those extrinsic self-enhancing values, the more kids are, okay? Um, we also know that, and this goes back to, remember how I talked about fear-based messages could be moving people in the wrong direction? Well, it's also the case that parents who raise their children in a more nurturing, warm, and supportive fashion end up with children who are more focused on the intrinsic values, whereas more cold and controlling parenting is more, leads to children being more focused on those extrinsic values for money and status, okay? Now, from what I know about indigenous cultures, they tend to be more on the warm and supportive end of things, and so I would guess, again, that that sort of style is gonna move people more towards those intrinsic values. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you, really interesting. Something keeps coming into my mind that's sort of bugging me, which is um, I'm thinking about Darcy Winslow here in Portland who worked with Nike Corporation, mm -hmm. and she tells a story which is really compelling about how she, as a change agent within that organization, that corporation, had her own awakening around sustainability in the early 90s, and was trying to find a way to shift the culture. And she, through her uh, research and networking with other people in the business community, she found this um, archetypal 
uh, I don't know, like a toolkit, mm -hmm. sort of like taking archetype and in a business way, kind of business corporatizing it a bit. So you take a sort of a, you, you assess what your archetype, kind of the dominant archetype is. And she, this has been applied organizationally. Mm -hmm. And so she realized that appealing to Nike with a particular archetype, let's say that, um, that appeals to the intrinsic values, and she used Starbucks as a contrast, I know it sounds bizarre, but Starbucks apparently is like more of the feminine, like the caregiving, like you can appeal to the culture, because apparently I haven't worked in corporations, but they have very clearly defined cultures. So Nike, what she found is that by appealing to the save, appealing to let's care for the environment and nature was not working, it was just flat. Mm. And so she ended up tapping into what she's called the Shambhala warrior archetype, mm -hmm. which is okay, you know, this is the hierarchy kind of comp competitive, which I am assuming is in the circumflex, mm -hmm. is, a, is really more on that authority power. But what happened was it mobilized the corporation. I mean, I'm simplifying it, it's very complicated, but sure. you know, it, it, it worked, it, mo it was mobilizing, Enormous resources were invested eventually in developing new technologies for glue, for shoes, et cetera. And so Nike then shifted its public persona as being child labor, kind of evil, bad, to being more of kind of a, a warrior mm -hmm. in the green sustainability space. So the effect was what we would want, right? Mm -hmm. But how you got there mm -hmm. was through appealing to the so-called extrinsic. And so this is, I think, the core controversy around this work, mm -hmm. right, with the it kind is. of the green marketing folks use whatever means necessary to get the desired results, or do we need to actually do the labor, and then it brings up the sense, well, how do you actually, if that's the culture, mm -hmm. then wh where's the traction, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's definitely part of what the uh, debate has been around here and in the UK because a lot of people say, look, we're never gonna motivate people to uh, live in an environmental way unless we tell them that it's in their self-interest, okay? And self-interest in some cases is profit, self-interest in some cases is selling uh, more shoes, et cetera. I just, I guess I'm ignorant about this, but I, you say they change their image around uh, child labor elsewhere. Did they actually change their practices around child labor as well? Okay, so I, I just wasn't aware of that. Okay, so I guess the issue to me is that I have no doubt that marketing can work in terms of selling things at a short-term level on a self-interested basis. Don't get me wrong, okay? I'm sure that we can sell a lot of CFLs if we appeal to people on, solely on their self-interested concerns, okay? The issue that I would again raise is what sort of long-term damage might we be doing by continually capitulating to that worldview? And in the case of Nike, I guess I would really want to hear some more details about how that conversation unfolded. Because what I definitely believe is that the way that you talk about intrinsic and self-transcendent values to somebody who's very achievement-oriented is quite different than the way that you talk about intrinsic values to somebody who's more focused on those intrinsic values dispositionally. And so the story that I wonder about as I listen to what you said about Nike is whether or not she was actually activating achievement and power in these individuals, okay, or whether or not she was able to speak about achievement in a way which was connecting it more with those self-transcendent values, okay? You know, one of the things, if we're talking about archetypes and we're talking about myths, the standard hero myth is that you've got the person who goes out and does battle with bad stuff in order to benefit the community. And we can see that story in Jesus, we can see that story in Luke Skywalker, and we can see that story in Frodo, the Hobbit, okay? You know, it's the same story, the same mythological story over and over again about achievement, which is in the service of helping many others, which is tapping into those intrinsic kinds of values. So I'm wondering how much she was able to tap into the kind of that hero story, which is able to merge together the achievement and power in a way with those self-transcending values. 
And to me, and the research isn't in on this, okay, there, is a, there are a couple studies out there about this that are kind of in, in the works, but from what I understand, it's probably better to merge self-enhancement and self-transcendence together than to just focus on self-enhancement. She didn't go in, it sounds like, and say, you could make a lot more profit if you sold things just purely green. Right? That would be a pure appeal towards these self-enhancing values, and I think that would be the kind of thing which would be especially problematic from this viewpoint. The issue becomes to try to work with all these aspects of the circumflex, especially with the ones we know that are more beneficial in the long run for these kinds of uh, outcomes. So that would be my best understanding given the information you told me. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have, I have two questions. Firstly, you mentioned a paper that's due out uh, very soon, is it? would it be possible to get a copy of that before if it comes you, out? Absolutely, if you send me an email, I'll send you the paper. Great, second question. Um, where would you put on this simplex, or on, on the circumplex, um, the kind of values that the book Ishmael talks about? Now Ishmael, um, I've taught environmental psychology classes and I've used Ishmael as one of the texts. Uh -huh. And, and one of the um, premises that the book challenges is this whole notion that human beings have dominion over the earth. Right. Okay, so that, and students are transformed by the book. Mm. You know, they never thought in those mm -hmm. terms. And, they, and, and the, you know, the outcomes of, and the course have been, you know, um, transforming to, uh -huh. to be redundant. Um, so where would you put that on that circumplex and is it something that's ever been tested empirically? Whether or not Ishmael can have those well, effects. Well, no, the, the idea, the questioning of, of the dominion, which, uh -huh. is, which is very, um, which is based in religion, but right. it's core, and that's, and that's, so that's a core, as far as I'm concerned, that's a core value or a core belief. So where would you put that in the circumstances? Well, the idea that I have dominion is, a, is an issue of power. Okay. okay. That's an issue of, of status, that's an issue of me controlling others, of me being over others, being hierarchically right. above others. And so what's happening in part in that book, it sounds like, is a questioning of that sort of value. Yes, exactly. Okay? The second thing we know is that those universalism values tend to concern um, basically, if, if benevolence is more about caring about your in-group, the people that are close to you, uh, universalism is caring about the out-group, people who are much, uh, people okay. who aren't necessarily okay. my friends and family, but who are part of the broader picture of the world. And it sounds like um, Ishmael is also pushing people to be thinking about um, other species as yes. being closer to them than they yes. might otherwise want to right. believe. So it seems to me like it's, a, it's a, okay. uh, attacking this, and promoting that. Okay, good, thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Tim, I wanna thank you for all, all the work that you do and Thanks that you've that. done. I, I think it's very valuable work. Uh, I'm interested in social norms, and uh, if I understood you correctly when you were talking about Mayo's uh, recent study, he used kind of a social norm or peer pressure as a prime Absolutely. to change identity. So yeah. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about uh, how important social norms are toward uh, changing identity, uh, forming identity, mm -hmm. and if perhaps social norms can be more powerful than genetics or you know, other influences on identity. Okay, um, I'll probably duck that last one about genetics versus uh, nurture, my sense is that, yeah, sure, there's, you know, I, I think that most things turn out to be influential from both. Um, I think that social norms are wickedly uh, important in all of this. There's some really uh, important work done by a guy named Dale Miller on something called the norm of self-interest. Um, it's some very interesting work which shows that when you give people the opportunity to behave in um, a more altruistic way, and people being uh, people in North America in this particular case, their people experience this, um, this block in large part because they believe that they're weird if they don't act in a self-interested fashion. Because, the, and if you look at the research, there's a lot of research which shows that most people think that others, you know, that I'm not very self-interested, but a lot of other people are. 
Okay? So people are believing that they're living in an environment where other people are self-interested and where they would break the norm if they didn't act in a self-interested fashion. Now, of course, self-interest is focusing on those achievement and power values. And again, you know, in a culture like ours, you know, what, what's the mantra of corporate capitalism and of Adam Smith's um, capitalism, which is that we need to set people free to pursue their own and maximize their own self-interest, okay? So we live in a cultural system which has done a really good job of inculcating this norm in lots and lots of different aspects of our human behavior, end up pushing us more in this way and suppressing those more self-transcendent values. I would also add, like I said about advertising, you know, advertising is another place where we get these kind of social norm messages. Another one which I talk about a lot has to do with, you know, uh, are we referred, next time you're reading the newspaper or listen to the news, notice how often people are referred to as consumers rather than citizens, okay? Consumers is down here, citizens is up there. Okay, this has been a real big shift, and it's again, it's a social norm issue, because the more you hear yourself called a consumer, the more you're gonna think of yourself as a consumer instead of as a citizen. So that's another example. Another one has to do with the government, and it's uh, fetishism of gross national product and economic growth. You know, imagine if you will, just imagine if you will for a moment, that all of those times that you saw messages saying how the Dow Jones was doing, saying how much consumer confidence was this month, saying how much GNP um, had gone up or down. Imagine that all of those were replaced with information about how many species of birds had gone extinct this month, with information about how many kids uh, were hungry this month. Now, then you would be getting a whole different set of social norms, wouldn't you, every day. Every day you would be being told what's really important is how many birds have gone extinct and how many kids are hungry instead of what's happened to the stock market this month or this day. So we get these social norms pounded into us over and over and over again, multiple times a day in multiple different ways. That's why the system works so well to create profit. And so what I see is that, you know, the question of social norms, though, is a question of values, okay? And it's a question of identities. And so part of what I'm trying to suggest in this work is how important it is to say, are these the norms that really reflect the things we think are important? And can we actually make a whole lot of progress in, uh, in the environmental movement? We'll go back to Nike for a second. Nike, is Nike a publicly traded corporation or is it still privately owned? Okay, so if you're a publicly traded corporation, you have to, uh, unless you're a B corporation, which is a benefit corporation, you're beholden to the stockholders and you have to maximize profit. So what's gonna happen when those two things start to become in conflict? Well, by law, a corporation has to care more about profit than, uh, than anything else. That's a social norm again. So I think we need to be shifting and saying, what are really the ways we wanna set up the social norms in our culture and that reflect the values that are gonna help us environmentally and socially and elsewise? Thank you for a great question. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have basically a follow-up question to that, which is understanding the problem is half the battle, right? But figuring out how to affect change is also, you know, it's an enormous challenge and no it's doubt. perennially unclear to me how we actually change those values. So, I mean, you mentioned advertising and obviously there's lots of different types of media that have an enormous effect on values and social norms and I won't list all of them because yeah. we, we know them all. Um, and one of the examples that springs to mind um, that I found about just this year was that in the developing world they've started using, or I think actually they've been using them for a while, telenovelas and they embed uh, social messaging into them to mm -hmm. affect change in terms of public health, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's not in there overtly. They're right. hugely popular, they're watched by millions of people, and then they end up having a really positive impact on birth rates or um, AIDS transmission rates, et cetera. So mm -hmm. although it sounds facetious, I end up thinking of, well, what are our most um, popular forms of me media, like um, you know, the reality TV shows? Right. And I know that there are lobbying uh, lobbyists in Hollywood that try to affect these changes. But then I also start thinking, well, we are trying all of these things, but it's not happening as quickly as we would like or as quickly as we think 
it needs to happen. Right. Well, we're swimming upstream, aren't we? Because the only way those shows are going to get on the air is if advertisers are willing to advertise on them for right. most channels. So that's part of the issue um, right. that makes it within the system. That's how our media system is set up. We, I mean, we sold the airwaves. That's what happened. Okay, we sold the airwaves for a pittance, and now it's all for profit, and there's very little that's available that's not for profit, where we could have those kinds of novellas outside of the commercial realm. That said, I'm totally in favor of embedding these kinds of messages in all kinds of different media. Let's, I mean, already, that's what commercials are already doing. You know, you have commercial messages embedded in books now. People, commercial interests have paid novelists to mention their products in books. Okay, in rap songs, etc. Imagine again that we were able to figure out ways to bring those intrinsic values into a song that millions of people hear every single day. I think that's a wonderful strategy to go forth. To go to your broader question, how? You know, it's it, that's the million dollar question to use a capitalist metaphor. Um, you know, I, I think that the um, it's very difficult. And I won't lie to you in that respect. And there are days when I think that it's going to be very hard to change this system unless we start to, and, and I hate to say this, unless we start to have some major traumas to the system that make people want to wake up and say, we need to have something different. And then what I hope is that if we've worked out these different kinds of models and these different sorts of approaches, then we can hand it to people and say, look, OK, you're ready for change. Here we go. Let's give that a try. But the difficulty of making these kinds of changes in the current system is extreme. It's extreme. And my, my strategy has been that you've you got to start with the three or four winnable battles. Um, you know, and there are, there are a few out there that I think are potentially winnable. And to, to work on those, because that's going to start to build up some steam potentially. That's what we know from social movements. And I think we have to remember. Um, and I know this is so hard in the environmental case. You know, abolitionists worked for decades. Women's rights people worked for decades. Civil rights people worked for decades. And one of my major concerns about the environmental movement is that I think that this concern that we don't have decades has led people into a short-termist thinking, which has led them to make some really strategically problematic mistakes. Okay, and I understand why that's happened, but I have to think we, our only solutions are going to be decades long ones or once something bad has happened and then we can step in with a new solution. That's my, my concern. So I know that's not a very optimistic thing to say, but it is uh, one of the things that weighs on my mind a lot. Don't let me end on that, please. We have time for one final question, so uh, please. Oh, come on. Somebody, one last question so I don't end on that. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, well, we got two now. Okay. So, so I um, was just thinking about um, today, I read Joe Brougham's um, Climate um, Progress, and he was talking about efficiency being a really big part of the solution. Yes. And he talked about how California is so much better than most of the rest of the United States. Mm. And in fact, if all the United States was as efficient as the United S as California, we wouldn't have to build another power plant, mm. you know. So it's an amazing different thing. Now, it would be interesting to understand how that, which is real action, um, goes back to how people think about the environment mm. in California versus the rest of the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have anything there. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about what California has done in order to, to, to argue about that one way or another in the case of California. I do think that efficiency, certainly, we should be being more efficient. There's no doubt about that. And I think there's a lot of efficiency things that we can do. The problem with a lot of efficiency solutions, in my mind, the first one is that, um, A, we've got the problem of the rebound effect because it might lead to efficiency and savings, which then people end up spending on something more materialistic or... So you say, by 
Well, but again, we don't, that doesn't include things like now that I've saved some money that I'm going to go fly someplace else, okay? That wouldn't be in those efficiency things. Uh, the second thing is that all the data I see suggests that efficiency can get us somewhere towards the carbon emissions problems that we have. I don't see how it's doing much about pollution. I don't see how it's doing much, if anything, about species extinction. And I think we need to be just as worried about species extinction as we are about carbon emissions uh, in the long run here because there's some really scary stuff going down with regard to uh, the number of species that are dying on this planet that could have major ramifications for us and others. So I think efficiency can take us a ways, but not far enough. We, we won't be able to hear you if you're not at the microphone. Okay. If you don't Maybe mind. we'll so just let's go move ahead. on to the uh, yeah, sorry. brief okay. brief questions, and we can fish, okay. finish My up. My question is: uh, Would you have any remarks about the role our educational institutions, particularly our kindergartens, uh, yeah. elementary school systems, which in some cases are, you know, I, I hate to say it, are beginning to uh, collect uh, advertising revenues and but, and uh, it, there's a, a nice um, contrast uh, to what happens in a lot of public uh, educational systems uh, in the, the private uh, school system of the Montessori approach, yeah. which uh, I have some experience with, but I just Sure, I think education, education really is super important. The last place I gave a talk like this was actually at the National Association of Research and Science Teachers. Uh, talking about how to start to integrate some of these things into science education. And I think that there's a lot of ways that we can do it, and it has a lot to do with how is it that children are learning about science of uh, environmental challenges, and which way is it being framed? Is it being framed in an economic fashion, or is it being framed in caring about the rest of the world and um, other species on this planet? So I think that's one of the most important things we can do, is ask ourselves, how are we framing these things to kids? Another thing that um, I think you, know, you alluded to has to do with commercialization. You know, one of the things that's happening in the public education system, of course, that's funded by tax dollars as tax revenue has gone down. What a lot of schools has, have done is to start to search out corporate sponsorship. Um, and so then you end up with things like Channel One, which uh, you know puts televisions into classrooms but makes kids watch ads. You have things like bus radio, where kids are listening to commercial uh, radio on the bus to school. Um, uh, an organization I was just affiliated with, joined with, uh, called the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood, joined with Friends of the Earth recently to uh, go after Scholastic. The American coal industry paid Scholastic a good amount of money in order to develop a fourth grade curriculum to talk about coal, and there was one, not one mention of coal contributing to global warming in that curriculum. Okay, and so uh, we joined together with Friends of the Earth, uh, wrote 50,000 letters to Scholastic, uh, and got two New York Times uh, articles and a Boston Globe article about it, and Scholastic backed out of the contract. So, you know, I think what we have to do is to be very much on the lookout for these kinds of things. At the same time, though, we have to ask ourselves the question, why is it that our school system is so underfunded that they have to go to corporations in order to pay, in order to educate kids? Okay, why is it that way? Well, it's because of our tax laws, all right? Why is it the corporations have the money to do it and our schools don't? Okay, I think we have to ask ourselves those questions and that gets us back to this economic system and questioning these things and as we talk to policymakers and um, people who run the school districts. So I think both of those levels are super important in terms of trying to educate the children but also to take a look fundamentally at how our public system is set up. Do I have time for this last question, this gentleman up brief, front? Please? Real, real quick, I'm just curious about um, your research tools, and your um, evaluation tools. Uh -huh. I'm just curious where, where I could get access to that. Okay, well yeah, uh, for the other circumplex, uh, if you send me an email, I'd be happy to email you the uh, aspiration index, which is the measure that's on there. Actually too, if you Google, just if you Google Tim Kasser, you'll see if you go down aspiration index on my website and you can download it right there. Um, for that particular one. Thank you. You bet. But thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. And there are the five free books right up front here if any of you want them. Um, and if uh, you want one and didn't get one in time, uh, again, it's freely downloadable at the website that I gave you, which I'll be happy to put up again. Yes. Uh, thank you, Tim. <laughs> Students, if you could please meet us over here in the corner. <laughs>